his little flock and numbers are not what is most important what is most important is that we are his flock and he cares for us as a shepherd does for his sheep let's take our Bibles and turn over to the book of first Timothy as you know for the past six weeks we've been comparing the threefold overview in Acts chapter 6 verse 6 with the definitive doctrinal explanation of what deacons are uh, we saw in Acts that they had to be men of good report, full of the Holy Ghost, and full of wisdom. And then we've been looking uh, over the last several weeks at what the Apostle Paul explains that as he divides it up doctrinally in 1 Timothy chapter 3, explaining to Timothy what deacons must be like. And tonight, the Lord willing, we'll be also looking at elders because the apostles in the early church are functioning as elders, but by the time we get to the end of the book of Acts, we find that the Apostle Paul has appointed elders in every church where he has been the evangelist of that church. Uh, the evangelist is not what we think of today, someone who does pep rallies in churches or someone who holds large crusades and then goes to another town and leaves those who have trusted Christ to whatever happens to be out there who said they wanted to participate, whether it be uh, Roman Catholics or Episcopalians or uh, Baptists or Presbyterians. Uh, that's happened, as you know, over the past 100 years in various so-called evangelistic crusades. What we look at in the New Testament is an evangelist is one whom God has called not just to lead people to Christ and gifted them that way, but also to build them into Bible preaching churches. We would look at our missionaries today, church planting missionaries that way as men with the gift of evangelist. And so tonight we want to see how all of that ties together, the various spiritual gifts that God gives to uh, the men who are qualified to fill the office of deacon and spiritually qualified to fill the office of elder or bishop. Before we begin, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the marvelous truth of your word. This is your word, it's not our word. You mean business when you give us these clear teachings in the scriptures. Even as we believe truly in justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, by your grace alone, uh, and we cannot change what your text says about that, even so we should be open to what your word says about those who should be in positions of authority in the church, in the local church, in the body of Christ. Uh, too often we decide that we would like to change certain things to suit our fancies, but, Father, when we do that, we'll end up just like the Roman Catholics have done. They've changed things to suit their fancies, and as a result, have defected from doctrine and become apostate. 
We pray, Father, for your special mercies upon us here in this place, that you will send us men who are truly qualified to be deacons, men who are truly qualified to be elders, those who are truly qualified to lead this church in this location, as well as in other Bible-believing churches across this land and around the world. We thank you, Father, for times past, but we are not in times past. We are now in time present, and by your grace we need your help so that this church might flourish and abound and demonstrate truly what the Word of God declares to be a true local church holding forth the Word of life to those who are lost. So, Father, we pray for your blessings on this, the going forth of your Word, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we are looking at verses 8 through 10, we discuss what the Bible says, not what we say, but what God says deacons must be like. You cannot say, well, okay, I know there are 17 qualifications for deacons, and we've looked at each of those different qualifications, but uh, after all, it's okay if they miss one or two of them. Well, if they can miss one or two, why not three or four, why not five or six, or why not all 17, just as long as you've got a, a human breathing body up there counting money. No, that's not what we see as we look into the Word of God. We cannot selectively pick and choose what we would say would make the qualifications of a deacon. We've seen 17 different clear-cut qualifications that God has given for deacons and also for their wives. As we saw last week, a deacon must be married and his wife must possess certain character qualities or else she disqualifies her husband. Even so, the wives must be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. And we saw that that is an imperative in Greek. I'll cover that in again, again in just a little bit for those of you who might have missed it. Um, the deacons must be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then Paul explains some of the practical results of that in the final three verses of the chapter. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Here's how you're supposed to behave. If you're in a local church, this is how you should behave. You should have this kind of leadership in the local church if you want to behave the way that God says we should behave. And then the content of the doctrine which we will be getting into that the deacons not only have to proclaim but also must be undergirding all of those who are in position of elder or bishop without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. How important it is. You know how many... Cultic groups have gotten off base on that first one concerning the incarnation, the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. God became a man in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. <clears throat> now last week we were dealing primarily with the wives and I want to cover that very quickly, review it once again. Uh, because that brings us then full circle back to elders who are first listed in 1 Timothy 3. We started with deacons because we're going through the book of Acts and we were in Acts chapter 6. But I want to go back and pick up the elders because it is from the body of the deacons that the elders are chosen. Even so must their wives be grave. That's the same word used of the deacon in verse 8. Here in verse 11, the wives must be grave. That's semnos, serious of purpose having respectability in conduct, one who is reverend, one who is august. It's a term that Paul uses for aged men in Titus chapter 2 and verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, that's semnos, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. You know, it's rather interesting, and I've said this before, you'll hear me say it many times, the qualifications that are given for elders and deacons are not way out unattainable qualifications. These are things that should characterize the normal Christian life. They were not, and they are not now, spiritual giants. They are spiritually normal. The rest of us are spiritual pygmies. We must not look at this and say, wow, that's unattainable. No, these are attainable. In fact, that word semnos 
is used of things that all believers are to focus their thinking on in Philippians 4.8, where it is translated by the word honest. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, that is semnos. Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That should be the focus of every Christian. Wives need to understand and to recognize and to practice the seriousness of their husband's responsibility. It's important to understand that the position of influence is often stronger than the position of authority, and they have a responsibility if they would be the wife of a deacon. Not slanderers. That's the next one. That's a false accuser, diabolos, where we get our English word devil and diabolical. Just like her husband, the wife has to have a controlled tongue. And you remember we talked about deacons not being double-tongued. Well, the wife also has to have a controlled tongue because she with her husband will be caring for the widows and the orphans. And she will hear in various contexts things that must not be repeated. It is not the beginning of the gossip mill. It is not the beginning of rumors that fly through the church and destroy people. If a man wants to meet all the qualifications... It includes the qualifications of his wife, not a gossip, not given to finding fault with others, not one who spreads innuendo and criticism in the church. If she does, she automatically disqualifies her husband. Not slanderers. That's used of apostates in the last times. It's used of those who are denying the faith, those who are without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, diabolos. Incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good. It's a word that's used as a prohibition for older women who must set the example for younger women in Titus chapter 2, verse 3. The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviors become of holiness, not false accusers. You see, the wife of a deacon must be this way, not false accuser, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. We've said before it's used 34 times, the noun form of Satan. Anybody who has a wife like that, must not be a deacon. Then we saw the term sober, nephalios. That word that is used of the qualifications of a deacon's wife is also used of elders earlier in the passage, and we'll get to that. But nephalios is the word used to describe a deacon's wife here. It's an interesting technical word we said last week. It means to be free from the influence of any intoxicant liquor or drugs. That would include... And this touches us today in our society. That would include the abuse of prescription drugs and non-prescription drugs. There are so many things that are available over the counter, including addiction to prescription narcotics like morphine or other narcotic painkillers or addiction to nicotine, one of the addictive drugs in tobacco. It's the same word translated vigilant in verse 2, where it's used of the qualifications of an elder. Same word in the translated sober of a deacon's wife is the word translated vigilant in verse 2 of the elder. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, a different word. We'll get to that when we talk about the bishops, but the word translated vigilant here. Sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. The has a dual impact. We studied that in detail last week. Number one, free from the use of alcohol, liquor, intoxicant drugs, but it also includes the reason, so that a person will be watchful and have full use of their senses. And we see that word nephalios used in multiple passages where it's very clear that it's talking about one who has full use of their senses so that they are alert and watchful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, 7, and 8, Therefore let us not be sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Verse 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and put on, but they that are drunken are drunken in the light. But let us, who are of the day, be sober. That's nephalios. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, watch thou, that's nephalios. Watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. We talk about the pastoral epistles, Timothy and Titus, actually, uh, those are the epistles dealing with a man who is an evangelist. He must do pastoral work, but he is also one who is involved in planting local churches. We'll talk about that later. 
1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, nephalios, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We see it tied together with another watch in 1 Peter 4.7, The end of all things is at hand, therefore be sober, nephalios, and watch unto prayer. 1 Peter 5.8, you all know it, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Since the husband has a position of responsibility, the wife must be free from outside controlling force of the flesh, which might cause her to misuse or abuse that which is entrusted to her husband. And that's why Paul moves into that next qualification. Faithful in all things. The wife of the deacons must be capable of being trusted with anything and in any situation. Because she's going to hear things that have to be kept confidential. Faithful in all things. And we talked about how that's a play on words there from the root word of faith and also the verbal form to believe. Obviously the wife of the deacons, each wife of each deacon, must be a faithful, Bible-believing, solid Christian. And then 1 Timothy 3.12, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. As we pointed out and discussed in some detail last week, the phrase let be is actually a third person plural present active imperative in the Greek, estosan. It's not, well, if they happen to be married, it's they must be the husbands of one wife. They must each have a wife. God requires deacons to be married. Now tonight we're going to look back at the first part of this passage, which deals with elders. Starting in verse 1, 1 Timothy chapter 3, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And we saw already that deacons had to have that all the way back in Acts chapter 6. We saw that was one of their necessary qualifications, which Paul developed then in that passage where we looked at the qualifications of the deacons. That must carry through also with those who are elders. And then in first, uh, excuse me, in Titus chapter 1, Paul gives additional qualifications. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Dirty money. Now the first thing I think we need to notice as we look at those two passages, the passage in 1 Timothy 3 and the passage in Titus chapter 1, that elders and bishops are equated. Did you hear the way that Paul did that in Titus chapter 1? He talks about ordaining elders in every city, verse 5, and then verse 7, for a bishop must be blameless. The elders and the bishops, they are not two different categories of people. They are dealing with the same people, but they are emphasizing two different things with the two different terms that are used. The term elder designates spiritually mature men with the gift of pastor-teacher, and we'll talk about that as we get a little farther into the text. Not tonight, this is a multi-evening presentation. Obviously, we can't cover all of it tonight. There are 21 qualifications 
For elders, there are 17 qualifications for deacons, 22 different spiritual gifts, of which one is the gift of teacher, and a separate gift, which is the gift of pastor-teacher. Very interesting copulative tie in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul is listing the leadership gifts there. But what we are looking at tonight, the term elder, designates spiritually mature men with the gift of pastor-teacher appointed by the evangelists or the apostles who are functioning in the larger sphere as the evangelists of the apostolic church to oversee the local congregations. The term bishop emphasizes the function, the responsibility, and the authority of the elders in overseeing the congregation, and we'll look more in detail at that term episkopos, or when we get to it, the business of oversight and the issues of responsibility and authority. The next thing that I think is very interesting to notice, that in every New Testament church, the elders are always seen in the plural. That's very important. The elders are always seen in the plural, in contrast to some modern churches that claim the term only refers to the pastor of a church that has multiple deacons. There are good brothers in many different groups that believe that there's just one elder in the church, he's the pastor, and that there are other spiritual leaders in the church who are the deacons who are responsible for the spiritual leadership of the church. That's not the way it's presented in the New Testament. Uh, we won't have time to look at all those passages tonight. We'll look at some of them. But every time you find a New Testament church where elders are spoken of, you will find them in the plurality. Uh, the way in which the term elder is used here, and I'll, I'm sorry, I have to give you a few Greek lessons as we go along, but it's a generic use of the word where it is describing a particular characteristic of a particular type of individual. Not just saying the elder of the church must be. That's not what it says. We'll get back to that as we look at the Timothy and Titus passages a little bit later on. They're always seen in the, in the plural in the New Testament in any of the churches that you have. In the New Testament and also in the Old Testament, we find the word elder used in a number of different ways apart from those who are actually elders in churches. We see it used, for example, uh, in the following ways. We see it used of age say in the Gospels, and there are multiple illustrations of this. I'll give you just one. Uh, you know the story of the prodigal son. It says now his elder son was in the field. We're dealing with age in this situation. Uh, we find it used of those who are ancestors. Hebrews 11, verse 1 and 2. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. The Apostle Paul is referring back to the ancestors, those who were the progenitors of the Hebrew race at that point, who had walked by faith, and we get that list in Hebrews chapter 11. We find the term elder used of rank or position of responsibility among Gentiles. Uh, you've just heard me preaching on that out of the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 7. Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. It is used for those who are in position of responsibility among the Gentiles. We find it used of the rank or position of responsibility among the Jews, at least in three different ways. Those who were the heads of families. For example, in Numbers chapter 11, where they are numbering the, the leaders of each of the tribes and uh, those who are in positions of authority at the head of families, the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them into the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. We find that term, elders, is used of members of the Sanhedrin in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Those who are in positions of authority in Israel, those who are members of the Sanhedrin who would be responsible for putting Christ to death. We find that the term is also used of those who manage public affairs in various cities. We see it used that way in the Gospels. A certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for him whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation and hath built us a synagogue. 
These are people in charge in Capernaum, those who are the leaders, the ruling leaders in a city. We find the term used of the 24 elders in heaven that are surrounding the throne in Revelation 4, verses 4 and 10. We find, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. The four and twenty elders, in verse 10, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And someday we'll have the privilege, I hope, of preaching through the book of Revelation and finding out more about those 24 elders. And of course the term is used, as we see it here, of the qualified leaders appointed over every congregation who have been gifted by the Holy Spirit, particularly with the gift of pastor-teacher, and raised up and qualified by the Holy Spirit for the work of the spiritual care and oversight of the churches. And it is important that we remember it is elders those who are spiritually mature. You see, you get your spiritual gifts at the moment of salvation. I was saved at age three. I was given at that moment by the Spirit of God the gift of pastor-teacher. Was I qualified to exercise that gift in the context of being an elder in a local church at age three? The answer is no. Obviously not. There has to come a period of qualification. There has to come a period of training. There has to come a period of spiritual maturity before a man is allowed to exercise that gift in its correct context. Oh, those of you who were with us some years ago, I guess it was about three years ago, uh, we went through spiritual gifts in Wednesday evening prayer meeting. Talked about the 22 different things that are called charismata, uh, that is the term that's translated as the spiritual gifts uh, in the New Testament. We saw that some of those, seven in particular, were only for the apostolic age. But we saw that the other ones continue on, the 15 remaining gifts continue on into this part of this time where by God has given leadership in the church with the gift of pastor, teacher, evangelist, and teacher. And then we find different service gifts that are listed under that as well. And people have more than one gift. You don't only have one gift, you'll discover that you have multiple gifts, and God uses those at different times in the context of the necessity of the church, so that the church always has a full complement of what is necessary for that church to function in a way that pleases Christ. Because the Holy Spirit divides severally to every man as he wills. Not according to our wills. You don't pray through till you speak in tongues or some charismatic nonsense like that. You know, you don't get the gifts that you decide you want to have and you don't want the ones that you got. You take what God gives you because God's going to place you in a church. God is going to gift you so that you will be able to fulfill the ministry that he gives to you in that church. You know, it's, it's so interesting to me to see how, in the charismatic movement especially, they exalt all the gifts that Paul says are down at the bottom and they sort of ignore the gifts that God puts up more importantly. We're not going to talk about spiritual gifts tonight. We've got to keep on going here. But we need to understand that the Holy Spirit gives the gifts that are necessary to the men who will be in the positions of leadership in the church. But it's not merely a matter of being gifted. It is also a matter of being raised up and qualified by the Holy Spirit for particular work in the body of Christ and for the work particularly for those who are elders of the spiritual care and oversight of the churches. We find two other passages that I want to uh, deal with very quickly, uh, go through them, because it also deals with elders who are going to be functioning in a church. We find, first of all, the way in which they are brought into that position as elders in the church in the first passage in Acts chapter 14. And in the second passage, we discover that a man may have attained that office, may be fit for that office, and may at some point either sin or defect and be removed from the office, though he does not lose his gifts, but may be removed from the office. And he may be a man who, because he turns self-willed, begins to destroy the church. Acts 14, verses 21 through 23. When they had preached the gospel in that city and had taught many, they returned again unto Lystra 
and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. Brother Johnson mentioned that this morning, this passage here. And it's interesting, it is the Apostle Paul and Silas that ordained the elders in every church and had prayed with fasting and then commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. But then we get down to chapter 20 and we find that there are going to be some things in the future that go wrong. Paul is going to Ephesus. He's on his way to Rome. And um, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. He didn't go to Ephesus. He would have never gotten away. The people there loved him. Uh, the people there would have just thronged him. They, they would put the whole church in turmoil. He simply called for the elders of the church. Ephesus had multiple elders. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day in which I came into Asia, after what manner of I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And now I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. So we find both the broad public presentations and also, if you will, home Bible study going on with the Apostle Paul. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, this next part is very significant. Now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Paul had the gift of prophet. He knew the things that were coming. He knew that he would never again have opportunity to preach the word of God at the church in Ephesus. I wonder how that affected Paul. We know how it affected the rest of them. It tells us at the end they are weeping. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You know, every church has its own pet peeves, its own pet doctrines, its own pet, we've always done it that way before. We're not going to change now. The Apostle Paul preached all the counsel of God even though they didn't like it. Dear friends, I know I've preached some things here you don't like. Perhaps some of the things I'm dealing with in elders and deacons you don't like. But what we're looking at is the word of God. This is God's word. This is what God says are qualifications. This is what God says is necessary if the church is to be strong and healthy. But even there, there is danger. Listen to what Paul says. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. The church doesn't belong to us. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. And we're not talking about buildings. We're talking about people. The church, the ecclesia, is the body of believers. It is the church of God. He, God, purchased it with his own blood. That's a proof, by the way, for the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we find in this same passage proof for the deity of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul is putting a lot of things into a condensed nutshell at this point. It belongs to God. We do it God's way. But he says there is danger. There is always an external attack from Satan. But there is also going to be an internal attack. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Wolves on the outside, quislings on the inside. Attack from the devil on the outside, attack by those who want to split the church and drag people after themselves. You know, the church has faced that 
ever since the apostolic days. And every Bible preaching church through the centuries has faced the same thing. Attacked by wolves on the outside, attacked by those who are so self-important that they want to draw people after themselves. Oh, who knows? It may be for power, it may be for money, it may be for immoral purposes. The elders of sin rebuke before all that others also may be fear. There are different reasons why elders do what they do. Different reasons why they defect or try to split churches. Deacons do it too. Congregational members do it too. But it is most painful when there is a power struggle between leaders. Because of personality conflicts. Because of the cult of the person rather than the focus on the gospel of Christ. And he explains some of that as he goes on here because he tells about himself. Wherefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. I spent three years teaching you this. Don't forget it. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. And here he explains one of the reasons that some people push hard for leadership in the church. And we see that in Rome. We see it in the charismatic movement. We see it in other Protestant churches. Those who will preach what tickles men's ears so that they can receive big bucks. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I paid my own way, said the Apostle Paul. He had the right to receive an income from the churches. He makes that clear in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians. But that wasn't why he was in the ministry to make money. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, and here the Apostle Paul is quoting something we don't find in the Gospels. John tells us, of course, in the last verses of the Gospel of John, many other things Jesus did, <laughs> which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Here we find something else that Jesus said that wasn't recorded in the Gospels. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And the Apostle Paul quotes it for us here. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And by the way, this is not the only place in Scripture where this kind of thing occurs. We find that in the Gospels it says, spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. And then he gives a quote that a lot of people have tried to... <clears throat> Associate with Zechariah, because it's written by Zechariah, but Jesus didn't say that it was written by Jeremiah. He said that it was spoken by Jeremiah, although it was also written by Zechariah. Pay attention to what the words say. Don't try to say, well, it was a mistake or it was a typographical error, <laughs> a scribal error back in those days. No, the scripture means what it says. And here's something that our Lord Jesus Christ said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, as we look at this term elder here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it's a translation of the Greek word presbyteros. We get the name Presbyterian from the word that is in Greek, the word for elder. It comes from the Greek root word prepo, meaning to be distinguished, to be conspicuous, to be outstanding. Obviously, it's related to setting an example. And if you recall many, many, many moons ago, when we were going over the spiritual gifts, and we talked about the various gifts, the gift of ruling and the gifts of governments. That weren't, those were not gifts that relate to being bosses. Those were gifts that related to standing before those who are under authority to set an example for them, to make provision for them, to be a help to them. Prohistemi, to stand before. That is one of the responsibilities of those who are elders, teaching by example as well as by word. We find that term used both in biblical and classical literature. It always implies dignity and wisdom. I did not go over the classical Greek literature where that term is used. I gave you illustrations only out of the scripture. But it is a word that is a very important word because it deals with those who will exercise appropriate and proper leadership. And in the context of the New Testament, it is the appropriate and proper leadership as ordained by God and as empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
We must never forget that. Where we find in the New Testament the singular form of elder being used with the article, like we find it here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 or Titus chapter 1 verse 7, when it's used with the article, it's used in the generic sense to, note, represent, uh, to denote the representative of a class of people. For example, we find um, in Matthew chapter 18 verse 17, it talks about the Gentile and the publican. Well, obviously we're not talking about all Gentiles and all publicans. Uh, indistinguishable as only being one person. Or the laborer, as we find in Luke chapter 10, verse 7. There's not just one Gentile, there's not just one publican, there's not just one laborer who is in view here. It is talking about a class of people. Now, a man who becomes an elder, we find um, the scripture explains to us in Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, uh, we saw the way in which a man became an elder in that particular passage. And the word where it talks about appointed elders in every city, that's the word keronteano. And it means to choose by stretching out the hand. Reach out and say, buddy, you're it. <laughs> Put your hand on the shoulder kind of idea. Or as we see in ordinations, the placing of the hands upon the head. Who was it was doing it here? It was Paul and Barnabas who were appointing the elders in the various churches that they were revisiting in recognition of those who had been manifesting themselves as gifted by God to discharge the functions of an elder. That word obviously carries with it the authority of the one who founded the church, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's also used of the churches of Greece, appointing those who were to accompany the Apostle Paul in conveying their gifts to the poor saints in Judea in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 19. The compound to choose before is used of God in Acts chapter 10 verse 41. And it ties in with the doctrine of election, ties in with the doctrine of predestination. It is never used of a congregational vote to place elders over them. Very interesting. Now, we don't like to hear that, but that is never used that way in the New Testament. The word to appoint, kathistemi, is for the purpose of setting an example. We talked about that before. The word that is used when Paul tells Titus, one of his fellow evangelists, to appoint elders in every city of Crete. Paul and Barnabas were not the only ones who did it. In Acts, we find Paul telling Titus that he is also supposed to do that in Titus chapter 1. It's an authoritative determination to be made by the evangelist. The same word is used in multiple different passages, find translated different ways. We find it translated make, where it's used of the Holy Spirit making elders and bishops, but using the human agency of an evangelist. We find it used in Acts chapter 6 verse 3, a point. Deacons are sought out by the congregation, but their final appointment, as we saw when we studied Acts, the final appointment is by the apostles in that passage. We find it translated ordain in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, the right of the evangelist to appoint the elders based on the divine qualifications that are given in these two different passages. We saw that in Acts chapter 14, that passage you read just a moment ago, where was it to be? It was to be in every church. We find in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Paul talking to Titus, it is to be in every city where there is a church. We find further evidence of this position is offered in the fact that the lists of qualifications for elders, bishops, and deacons are written to the evangelists, Timothy, and Titus. You don't find those lists of qualifications written in the church epistles. You don't find them in Romans. Well, you find gifts in Romans, where it tells us specifically the Holy Spirit gives them. You find spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians, that's a church epistle. You find the spiritual gifts, Peter lists a few of them in 1 Peter. But you don't find the qualifications for the officers of the church, the elders and the deacons, you do not find those in the church epistles. Where you find them is in what we call the pastoral epistles. Epistles run, written to young men who were performing the work of evangelists. They were missionaries, they were church planting. Remember that passage we read about Timothy? Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. That's what Paul writes to Timothy. 
But we don't find those qualifications listed for churches because it's not churches who are designed to vote on those who will be in positions of authority over them. Because many people in the churches will be immature Christians. Some won't understand the principles of the word of God. And majority vote is not what places men in those positions. They must be qualified by God. They must have the correct training. They must have an understanding of the word of God and be mature, pure, moral, spiritual Christians who will set an example for those under their authority. A very important observation not to be forgotten. The apostles considered themselves elders having been appointed by Jesus Christ himself. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, I'm an elder, I'm writing to the elders who are among you. He didn't really say, I'm an apostle, so therefore you better listen to me, because you elder guys are like lesser than I am. He speaks of himself as an elder, and among other elders in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. We find John refers to himself as an elder in 2 John chapter 1, of course the only chapter in uh, 3 John chapter 1 as well. The office of elder bishop is based upon the work of Jesus Christ, just as the spiritual gifts are based upon the work of some member of the Godhead, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. You know, it's rather interesting, and I know our time is almost up at this point. Um, if you can recall back three years ago, in our study of pastor-teacher, we saw that all elders have that gift of pastor-teacher and must be functioning in it properly. You know, when we looked at that passage in Acts chapter 20, I read it just a few minutes ago, his, Paul's farewell address to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30. It's addressed to elders, clearly. And they're at the church at Ephesus, verse 17. What are they exhorted to do? It says, they, Paul says, feed the flock. That word, feed, poimino, to pastor. Pastor the flock. And then, he says, you're to oversee the flock. And that's the same root word from which we get our root word, bishop. The flock of God. You see, elders have responsibilities that normally the congregation thinks of, that's only related to the pastor. That's not true. That's related to those who are elders. Not merely elders by name, for there are many men who sit in the office of elder across this land and around the world who certainly are not qualified. And many men who claim the title of bishop in not only believing churches, but in apostate churches who certainly are not qualified to oversee the flock of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. So I think it's obvious, and I'm going to close with this because there are many other passages that we could look at. But in light of the lessons that we've seen on spiritual gifts and in light of these statements here in 1st Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1 the position of elder is not a position open to women now right down the street from us there's a church here that claims as their pastor the Reverend Dr. And so and so female you read constantly and someone handed me a newspaper article at lunch today where it was talking about someone who claims to be a pastor and a bishop who is a female and it was talking about how, uh, you know, God must have a sense of humor, and then they, they spend all their time telling jokes in the pulpit. Very sad, folks. You will end there if you do not start here and finish here in the Word of God. If you say, well, this particular qualification is not necessary, therefore, we can eliminate it because we've got somebody who fits the other qualifications. Eventually, you will knock out all the qualifications that don't quite fit the way you like to think, and you will end up with someone who is not qualified according to the Word of God. The position is not open for women because it requires the gift of governments, which we talked about before, the gift of teacher, the gift of pastor-teacher, all of which are given only to men, and places the person in a position of authority and leadership over the church, which is not allowed to women. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 and following, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 through 38. Well, next week we'll deal with that in a little more detail. We'll 
I've only quoted references for you tonight. Next week we'll look at some of those specifically and go through the terminology so that we will understand what God says about those who are in positions of authority in the church. There are qualifications because you see as a man fails in one or more of the areas of qualification that God has ordained, you will see that same problem rippling through the church. What you see in microcosm in church leadership is what you will experience in macrocosm in the body underneath their authority. That is why every one of the 17 qualifications for deacons and every one of the 21 qualifications for elders are absolutely essential if we would see the church led and protected and growing in the way in which God says it should grow. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of looking into your word. We've covered some heavy doctrine tonight. We've covered some difficult concepts. We've looked at some technical principles that are very clearly stated in your word. Father, as we read the English, those things come through, but many times we say, well, he couldn't possibly have meant that. But you've made it very clear to us, both in English and in also the underlying Greek, that these are things that you have ordained specifically for the protection of your church, the church that was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for men who will lead this church in a way that brings glory to Jesus Christ. In a way that is at peace and harmony without division. For even at Ephesus, that, that great church that had such a great doctrinal epistle written to it, where they understood sound doctrine, where they were functioning properly, Paul warns them that not only would there be an attack from the wolves, but that even from among themselves, and he was talking to the elders, there were those who rise up and seek to draw away the disciples after themselves. Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray that you will bless it, that you will honor your name, that you will glorify yourself, that you will raise up in this place those men and those women who meet the qualifications for husbands and wives, where the husband can serve in the office of deacon, can serve in the office of elder, and do so in a way whereby this body is edified, glorifies Christ, grows in the faith, and is an effective witness in this community, and then from here out around the world. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.